Hello, this is Dr. Viv with a video on rotational dynamics. So let's take a look at this video which uh, was actually inspired by a quiz question from quiz number 8, practice quiz number 8. So if you've not taken a look at the last quiz question there, you should. Well, this is a variation on that question. So I replaced the two ordinary masses with spheres. Two spheres x and y are given and I put a spring in between them. Now initially the two spheres are just at rest and the spring is compressed completely as shown here and then released. When you release them the spheres are going to um, translate and rotate at the same time and the assumption here is that the floor is infinitely rough. Uh, the infinitely rough floor assumption ensures that the spheres roll without slipping. Now we are given a few things. One item is that the mass of sphere X is two-fifths the mass of sphere Y and they're both solid spheres but their radius or radii are not given. Um, the length of the spring compression is 10 centimeters and uh, the kinetic energy of the sphere X is found to be 50 joules. We are asked to determine the value of the spring constant K. So this problem is um, a very interesting one because of the things that you need to do to get the answer. First of all, when you have a situation with the uh, springs, you know that energy is involved, uh, but you have to be careful because we don't know yet what proportion of energy goes into X and what proportion goes into Y. It would be a classic mistake to think that because of this two-fifths factor, two-fifths goes into X and two-fifths goes into Y. That's simply not correct. The operating principle is actually momentum conservation. Linear momentum needs to be conserved in this problem. When the spring is just getting released, assuming that it takes not very long to do that, um, the external impulse is going to be negligible and so we can use the law of momentum conservation. Uh, momentum conservation gives us the uh, mass of x times the velocity of x plus the mass of y times the velocity of y is going to be equal to zero which is the initial momentum of the system it was not moving initially. So this actually tells me that mx vx is equal to negative my vy. The negative sign merely indicates that the directions in which they move are opposite to each other. Other than that the negative sign has no utility. So when I compare magnitudes I can ignore the negative sign and simply write mx vx equals my vy. Now uh, we have to decide what amount of kinetic energy goes into each object. So first let's write an expression for the kinetic energy. The kinetic energy is composed of two parts, the translational kinetic energy plus the rotational kinetic energy. Uh, the translational kinetic energy for the uh, problem is given in this case by the formula for regular objects. So that's going to be 1 half mv squared. I'll write it in general first and then apply it to either x or to y. And then for the rotational kinetic energy, I have one half i omega squared. The moment of inertia now of a solid sphere is given by a standard result, which is two fifths mr squared, where r is the radius of the sphere. Now, also, if there's no slip, so this is a standard result. You can look it up on any tables. 
the actual result is got by integration, but it doesn't need to concern us right now. Uh, the no slip condition has to be used to determine the relationship between v and omega. So that tells me that omega equals uh, v upon r. Observe it makes dimensional sense because omega is measured in uh, radians per uh, second and v is in meters per second and r is in meters. So when you divide them, you're going to get 1 over seconds, which is the same as radians per second. The reason I do this is because if you forget the no-slip condition, this is one way to recover the knowledge of what the no-slip condition is based just on units. So once you have uh, once you have that, you can then um, I just increase the light because it's rainy outside. Um, what I can now do is substitute for omega here. So when I do that, I'll get one half mv squared. I'll also write for a uh, substitute for i. One half times two fifths mr squared times v squared over r squared. So this is a classic feature of any problem where there's no slipping involved. The radii simply cancel. This is why I did not bother giving you the radius. It's not necessary to do so. So I get 1 half times 1 plus 2 fifths by combining the two terms, mv squared. Now 1 plus 2 fifths is 7 fifths, so that gives me 7 tenths mv squared. All right. Now the total kinetic energy, the given fact, is that the kinetic energy of x is given to be 50 joules. We can actually use that to set up a nice ratio. Um, the kinetic energy of x divided by the kinetic energy of y is going to be 7 tenths mass of x times the uh, speed of x squared divided by 7 tenths mass of y times speed of y squared. The 7 tenths factor simply cancels out. Uh, so that gives me I can write this as follows. I can write this as mx squared times vx squared divided by mx. Notice I've done nothing illegal because I've just written mx as mx squared uh, divided by mx, which is the same thing. Uh, similarly, I can write my squared vy squared over my for the denominator. Now, mx times vx, by this equation which I'll call 1, mx times vx is precisely my times vy. So I'll replace mx times vx with my times vy, and when I do that and square it, I get that. The denominator, I don't mess with it. Uh, now you notice what happens. The numerator um, exactly cancels the denominator, and then I get the inverse ratio, my over mx. So this tells us something extremely useful, and that is the kinetic energy ratio is the same as the inverse mass ratio. All right, so uh, we can now find the total kinetic energy of the object y. The kinetic energy of object y is important to get because the total kinetic energy of object x plus object y is precisely the spring potential energy. So that's what we are aiming for here. So this tells me that kx over ky is equal to my over mx but we are told in the beginning of the problem, let me just bring the statement back, that the mass of sphere x is two-fifths the mass of sphere y. 
Therefore, the mass of sphere y must be 5 halves the mass of sphere x. So that ratio is 5 halves, which tells me that uh, kx is equal to 5 halves ky. Now we are also given that the kinetic energy of x is 50 joules. <coughs> So this tells me that Ky is two-fifths Kx because it's Ky that I want. So that's two-fifths times 50 joules. That's 20 joules. <clears throat> so you notice that the heavier object gets less kinetic energy. That seems like a paradoxical result, but it's governed by momentum conservation. Momentum is a judge that decides how much kinetic energy each object gets. Once you have that, you just have to use conservation of mechanical energy. Initially, the mechanical energy was entirely the spring potential energy. So the spring potential energy becomes the kinetic energy of x plus the kinetic energy of y. So this tells me that 1 half the spring constant times the distance squared must be equal to the kinetic energy of x, which is 50 joules, plus the kinetic energy of y, which is 20 joules. So the whole thing is 70 joules. And now we can actually solve. Uh, distance d is given to us. It is 10 centimeters. I believe I put it over there. Let me remind you. There it is. d is 10 centimeters. So we can solve now for the spring constant Let's do that. Uh, K is equal to 2 times 70, which is 140 joules, divided by uh, distance d, which is 0.01 meters, the whole thing squared. So, um, excuse me, 0.1 meters, not 0 0.01 meters. 0 0.1 meters, the whole thing squared, so that becomes 140 uh, joules divided by 0 0.01, when I square 0.1, it becomes 0 0.01 meters squared. Uh, now, that is 1.4 times 10 to the 4 joules is newtons times meters, and that's uh, meters squared. There's 1 meters that cancels. Uh, sorry, not the whole thing. So that's going to be 1.4 times 10 to the 4 newtons per meter. Our answer that's the spring constant of the spring.